All right, well, welcome everyone. I am Laura Pring, a partner at Pring & Associates and the co-chair of the educational programming for the Women's Energy Network's Houston chapter, and I'll be your host today and have the honor of introducing our speaker, the chairman of the Texas Railroad Commission, Christy Craddock. Uh, on behalf of our WIN leadership team, we're pleased that you are all able to join us today. These driven and talented women you see on the screen make up our WIN Houston board. They lead the teams and programs that make WIN the amazing organization that it is today. And as many of you know, WIN is a not-for-profit organization. Therefore, we cannot exist without the support of our sponsors, as well as all of those willing to volunteer their time. So a big thank you to all our volunteers for keeping this organization thriving over the years. And a big thank you to our national sponsors and our chapter sponsors and partners. And for those of you new to WIN, WIN is an international organization with 20 chapters across the US and Mexico. We have over 6,000 members. And of those 6,000, approximately 2,000 are here in Houston. Our mission is to develop unique programming that provides networking opportunities and fosters career and leadership development to women who work across the energy value chain. And now to capitalize on those networking opportunities, we are going to launch our first set of breakout rooms. You'll be given a one minute warning and then automatically brought back into the main session at the end of that time. We strongly recommend turning on your camera if you haven't done so already during the breakout sessions to create a more organic conversation. You'll have about 10 to 15 minutes to introduce yourself to the others in the breakout room and to get the conversation going. Um, we have a question to discuss and that is what is your experience or exposure to the Texas Railroad Commission? Uh, you will be directed to your breakout room now and we'll see you back here shortly. Are you in a breakout room? Are we still in a breakout room? No, we're all coming back in. Oh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> we were we were a little late coming on, so we jumped in right in the breakout room. And I was like, what's going on? <laughs> no problem, sir. Yeah, we're uh we're driving to Dallas, so sorry, I'm in my car. <laughs> all good. I'm glad you could join us. Well, welcome back everyone. I hope you're able to make some great connections in your breakout rooms. Uh, as we come back into the main meeting room, we ask that you please put yourself on mute to avoid any disruptions. We'll be checking the chat function throughout the talk. So please be, uh, feel free to ask any questions or put any comments there. We'll address them with the chairman um, uh, at the end of, of her talk. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Christy Craddock was elected to the Texas Railroad Commission in 2012 and has held her seat for two terms and currently serves as chairman where she works to educate the public about the oil and gas industry and its impact in Texas. With a clear understanding that a strong energy industry leads to a strong Texas economy, Chairman Craddock pioneered the oil field relief initiative providing administrative and regulatory relief to companies during times of economic uncertainty. As a native of Midland, Chairman Craddock earned both her bachelor's degree and law degree from the University of Texas in Austin. During her career as an attorney, she specialized in oil and gas, water, tax issues, electric deregulation, and environmental policy. 
Chairman Craddock is an active member of the State Bar of Texas, University of Texas Liberal Arts Alumni Advisory Council, and Dell Children's Medical Center Foundation. And I could go on and on and probably take up all of our time with all that she's done for, for the state of Texas. But please join me in welcoming Chairman Craddock. Take it away. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you all for having me. It's nice to see you all virtually. I've come and spoken to your group before and it'll be nice to go back to work. I think our group at, at the Railroad Commission by September 1st will be back full time. And I think everybody's trying to figure that out as we speak. So it'll be nice to see everybody. Uh, today, I thought I'd talk about the Railroad Commission, kind of what we do, what this, the oil and gas industry specifically, how important it is to the state, and then what's going on legislatively. You know, I, Laura's like, are you coming back? I went, yes, I promise I'm coming back. There's a lot going on legislatively right now with 11 days left in the Texas legislature. So I've kind of, I've been on the, I've had five phone calls since I joined this morning already today. So it's uh, one of those busy times of the year. So to start with, the Railroad Commission is, I think, the most important state agency in the entire state, why we regulate the oil and gas industry and pipelines, surface mining, which have, has to do with coal, as well as pretty much every energy piece in the entire state if you are working on uh, mining or anything else. So how do we, we have a funny name though. So I always like to tell the history, your history lesson, Texas history lesson of the day, or the oldest state agency still in existence from the original founding of the of this Texas Constitution, were 130 years old. We really did regulate railroads until the 1980s when they were deregulated across the country, quite frankly. So it's all private regulation or federal regulation today. But a hundred and I guess 103 years ago now, we got oil and gas regulation. Why? If you go look at, for those of you who've ever been to Tyler and, and Longview, that area, if you go look at the oil for the East Texas oil fields, which is where we first found oil in this state, that at that point we were drilling oil wells like crazy without a lot of environmental regulation or regulation to protect the, the, uh, the mineral interest. And so the governor at the time, gave the Railroad Commission the job to regulate oil and gas in this state. Why? Because we were shipping barrels of oil, literal, bar literal barrels of oil on railroads, and he decided we already had those relationships and that made sense. So we're the oldest oil and gas regulatory body in the entire world. OPEC was founded because of what we used to do and still do a lot in this state. And so we like our history, we like our funny name, and we today have 850 people who work for us, 10 field offices across the state, as well as three commissioners that are all elected statewide. And Laura mentioned I'm the chairman right now. We rotate the chairmanship amongst the three of us. There are three that are all on rotating basis for that have six year terms. So I'm in the second year of my second term and actually have for in modern quote modern history, I've served as as the chairman for the longest stretch that we that anybody knows of, and that was my last time as, as chairman. So I'm now in my third time to serve as chairman. And what's the difference between the three of us? Nothing. We all run statewide. I say the chairman gets the first nasty phone call and gets to run our meetings. So we meet uh, uh, ever about once, twice a month on a Tuesday. We've been doing them by Zoom as well. And so, um, and we're getting ready. We're having those conversations about when we start meeting it back together in public. We're, we're, we've got an agency that frankly never went home in the last 15 months. We've been working pretty much full time uh, as an agency needed to and have made sure that the oil and gas industry has really been vibrant and continues to have an, an opportunity in the state. So what do we do? What's I'm kind of giving you an overview about what our history is, but what do we do today and day to day? Today we are the oil and gas regulator. What does that mean? We are for if you I'm going to start with pipes because I'm going to go back to the oil and gas piece. Pipes are important to the state. Pipelines and pipeline safety inspections are a priority for this agency. We have 480,000 miles of interstate, intrastate, and gathering lines in this state. 
that's the biggest state by a sixth and of the United States and always say we've now figured out we can go to the moon and back with the amount of pipe just sitting in the state of Texas. We also have gas utilities in the state. So if you have, for instance, in Houston, Centerpoint serves your, your home and, and that we regulate both the safety and the pricing for those gas utilities, that puts about another 500,000 miles of pipe in our wheelhouse. So we have a lot of pipe and pipe is important to us. Pipeline safety inspections are important to us. And we have inspectors across the state that do those inspections, roughly 70, give or take today, uh, based on federal standards, as well as railroad commission standards and what we do with, with inspection for pipe. We also do surface mining in the state. We have coal mines in the state. People forget that we have coal. Coal is an important part of the state's electric grid. It is on any given day about 30% of our electricity as you turn on your electricity. Those, cert, those mines are not uh, what we do in West Virginia. In this country, we do do surface mining. They're strip mining if you go to East Texas. And we have some, some mining along our border with Mexico. Uh, we do both permit and watch the remediation and part of the remediation to back to basically farmland most of the time in those in those um, mines. And so that it's a good story. Texas has a good story about what we do with remediation and that's important to us. We also do a couple of other things that people don't realize in this state. We have geothermal under our umbrella in, this, in the Railroad Commission. We haven't issued a geothermal permit in about 25 years, but we do have people knocking on our door looking at that as another new quote, new energy option, although it's been around for a long time. We'll, we'll look to see what happens with that, but we're ready to go with rules. And that would come through this agency. The other thing that we do in this state, we have uranium mines in the state. If you go to South Texas down in the area with the Eagle Fur, there are uranium mines. For new exploration uranium mine permits, we, and again, it, it's, uh, it's drilled like a water flood when you're looking at uh, how you drill and, and develop those resources. If you're looking at new uranium mines, you come to the Railroad Commission. For those that are existing, which we do have some, it's at the Department of Health. Go ask the legislature why they did it that way, but, but we do look at uranium mines and that's a piece of our energy portfolio. The other thing that we do at this agency that people don't realize, we have had rules in place since 2000 three for carbon capture and how we use that carbon capture primarily today has to do with enhanced oil recovery. We've been using that technology. In fact, we're the first state in the country with rules in place. We've been using that technology in the oil fields, specifically in West Texas and in the Conroe fields. And there's some legislation working its way through the process this cycle that would help us uh, continue to figure out what we do with carbon, whether and with poor space, and we are looking potentially to, um, to ask for primacy from the EPA when you're looking at carbon and carbon capture as well and injection well stuff. So that is an ongoing issue for us as well. It's important, not just for the short, but for the long term of the state. But a lot of what we do has to do with oil and gas, oil and gas production, as well as permits. So today, this state's the biggest. We're happy to be the biggest when you look at oil and gas production. We're producing roughly 3.66 million barrels of oil a day. That's down 9% from where we were about a year ago. We're also producing just under 26 BCF of natural gas a day. Again, that's down roughly about 8% from where we were a year ago. And we do about 600,000 barrels of natural gas liquids condensate. That's off about 13% from a year ago. I'll get to why in a minute, uh, but it's but we still that being all of that being said, we're still the produce about a third of the country's oil and the fourth of this country's natural gas is coming out of Texas. We're the biggest. We want to stay the biggest, and we have rules to make sure that that continues, and that's going to be important for us. So. We're all sitting in the energy industry, but why is oil and gas important for Texas? I said we're in a legislative session, and so they're working on the budget. And in fact, we hope they finalize it by Friday so we can see what we did or didn't get uh, and work through that process with the legislature. But it's this 
this state is very dependent on, on oil and gas. I started by saying I'm the most important state agency. Why? Because a third of the state's economy is oil and gas based in this state. That's a big piece of, the, of, of an economy for any state, but particularly for Texas. What does that mean really in numbers? Last year, we, we estimate that the industry put $13.9 billion with a B into the state's economy in all tax dollars and royalty payments. That's down from about 16 billion in 2019, but that's still a large percentage. That's about $38 million a day is coming into this state from oil and gas. That's a lot of money when you come, when you look at that. And I say tax dollars, look, we all are paying property taxes. You've probably got, if you're living in a house, you've gotten your property tax bills in the past month. You pay sales tax, you pay automobile taxes. We all pay the same taxes that the oil and gas industry pays, but they pay this other tax called severance taxes. What's a severance tax? In Texas and in Oklahoma and, and states that are oil and gas producers, when you've drilled a well and you sever that natural gas or oil from the, the mineral estate, you pay a tax on that. Today, it's roughly 4%, give or take, where you are and what kind of, what kind of well you've drilled. But those severance taxes are important. And where do they go? In this state, we send them to what we call the rainy day fund. So as the legislature started the session, there was roughly $11 billion with a B in that rainy day account. And that all comes from severance taxes. Now, before we get to use that, the legislature has to make a decision whether they use those dollars or not. And we'll see again as they get to the end of session, whether we've recovered enough after COVID that they need to tap into that rainy day fund. But before we even get to that $11 billion, money's been pulled out of those dollars. And so we put a basically a billion dollars comes out of the rainy day dollars that goes into permanent school fund, uh, funds all of our, our public schools today. We use about six and a half billion dollars over a multi-year period that goes to roads and road infrastructure. If you're on the roads, we haven't all been driving much, but we're getting back on the roads. And, and so that road infrastructure is going to be important in continuing to pave the potholes that, that develop, if nothing else, whether it's building new roads or not. And we also have an, a recurring dollars that are coming out that's a two out of two billion dollars over a 20-year period. So we've got about 15 of that, 15 of years left on that 20 year period to do water and water infrastructure projects, whether it's build new reservoirs or update water infrastructure in cities, for instance, they can use that as a bonding uh, mechanism. So when you think about it, oil and gas is paying for a whole lot more than even just one little part that we all think about and take all those dollars out that I just said, and we still have $11 billion in our rainy day fund. Now, last cycle, last legislative cycle, the legislature used those, some of the dollars out of the rainy day fund for Harvey recovery. We really had a rain of it four years ago, so it was important, as well as some property tax relief and school relief during that time period, and still we're back to $11 billion. So, that gives you an idea how important it is for the state to continue to have a good rainy day fund and to continue to have oil and gas. I, I think that's a one piece, but I always remind people, those are big numbers. And I like to go to Carnes County. I was in San Antonio yesterday and this guy goes, I'm from Carnes County. I thought, well, you may be the only person I've ever met who's from Carnes County because nobody knows what Carnes County is. It's a nice county south of San Antonio in the middle of the Eagle Ford. And five years ago, it was the most productive county in the entire country. Today, you've got to go to Midland or Reeves County, and they kind of bounce back and forth as far as the most productive county. But the two big oil fields in Texas have a big piece of production. And, but, and today, Carnes County is still in the top 10 of production counties in the state. And they really hadn't seen a lot of oil and gas. That was new for Carnes County as they got started about 10 years ago. What you, what you did with oil and gas, how they could use their tax dollars. Today, a, a, for their property tax dollars that go to school taxes in their county, their school taxes, roughly 78% of, of Carnes County's school taxes 
our oil and gas dollars and about 67, 68% of their county dollars are, are oil and gas tax dollars. That's a lot for a small county. So if you multiply that by the counties to have a lot of counties that have oil and gas production, that's a lot for the state, even locally. So uh, oil and gas is important. We other piece that we all forget about that I always like to remind us as we've been sitting and, and taking oil and gas really for granted. If you look at what's happened really with Colonial Pipeline and others, I think people recognize how important oil and gas is when they want to drive. But if you look at where we've been in the last year with COVID, look, the medical equipment that we've that we've watched all of our first responders use, whether it's mask, whether it's syringes, whether it's it's ventilators, all of that is an oil and gas product. They're all plastic. They're all an oil and gas product. It's important for us long term to remember that oil and gas doesn't touch just if we drive, just if we are turning on our lights on any given day. But every piece of plastic that we use in the world, some good, I hate plastic bags on the side of the roads, but some really good, some chemicals that we use across uh, whether it's to clean your house and clean your clothes, or we're using it for other products to develop products, oil and gas has a has a place and a very important place in our world every single day. And I always remind people if they don't like oil and gas, I'd be glad to take their cell phone or their computer because they are holding a piece of plastic that's important. And we really would not have a lot of the technology and the advances we have in the in the country and in the world without oil and gas. And so I don't believe they're going away. That being said, look, wind, solar, nuclear, oil, natural gas are important in the state. We're in a high growth state and we need energy of all kinds. And that brings me to where we are today and kind of what has gone on in the state. If you watched us for the last year at the Railroad Commission, we've had a lot of issues go on and we'll continue. And so one of the things I was doing this time last year, and I think all of us were, was figuring out what COVID was going to do, not just to ourselves, but to a, a broader world. And March of last year, which I call spring break, because I have a nine-year-old and we were on spring break, trying to have spring break as the world shut down, uh, changed a lot of the conversation in the state. And what it, we had a company, a couple of companies come to us and say, we think you need to prorate. We've watched Russia, we've watched Saudi Arabia, we've watched OPEC, decide they're going to produce more as we're beginning to need less in the world. And we're tired of them being in charge of the oil and gas industry. We think you need to tell us as operators how much we can produce so we can be part of the conversation. That's an interesting conversation. Proration is uh, telling how much you can produce from your wells. We haven't done that since 1972 on an active basis, and we still have the rules in place, but have not used them since. So it was a conversation we had as an agency and frankly, as an industry, that was really a vibrant conversation for about six weeks. Uh, we got a lot of feedback, whether it was in writing by phone call, or maybe some of you sat and watched the 11 hours of testimony that we had on Zoom before I knew what Zoom was. We figured that out in April pretty quickly as an agency and had 29,000 people on from countries all over the world in 49 states. Uh, Hawaii did not participate. That may be where I go in the next round. South Korea being our next highest participation of a country. So opportunities potentially there. They wanted to know what was going on. And after 11 hours of testimony from all sectors, and it didn't matter if you're upstream, midstream, or downstream, as well as landowners, a lot of participation. If you'll go back a week later, we watched the price of oil go to negative $39 and change, and which I never hope to see in my lifetime again. And at that point, I think as an agency, we recognized that the free market was going to work, that 5 million barrels of oil production that we had in this state a day really wasn't going to make a difference on a 100 million barrel a day worldwide production number, and that the free market was going to work, that the federal government and the president at the time got involved in, and had really strong conversations with the Russians and, and OPEC and said, look, y'all can't do this again. And by the way, this industry always seems to survive, particularly in the United States. 
And I appreciate that piece. So we as an agency decided not to prorate. About the time we made that decision, if you go a month forward, we were back at $45. And today we're sitting roughly at 65. I'm sorry I didn't look this morning, but that's been our rough number for the last few last few weeks and that's not a, that's a good number for this industry it's beginning we're beginning to see recovery meanwhile as an agency we were making sure that there were rules and regulations and things we could do that were realistic uh, help to this industry waiving some timelines waiving some fees to allow industry to to figure out how they could recover and stay alive and yet we've lost almost a hundred thousand jobs in this state starting to see some slow recovery, which is good. And today we're at 400,000 jobs, give or take, in the state. Um, but those 100,000 jobs are real jobs we've lost in this industry. And as we recover, and I say recover, I should say not recover, but regain our strength and, and come back, it looks different. It's beginning to look different again. And part of that has to do for us as an agency, uh, and it affects our budget directly, has to do with permitting. So as we got into the fall, our permit numbers were off 70% as far as our drilling permits. That's huge for this agency. And I should say we're off 73% for about three weeks. Uh, why is it huge for this agency? Not just because we watched rig counts go down and service companies uh, no longer be in business and we're watching mergers and acquisitions. That's huge too for this industry. But for our agency specifically, we're fee-based as an agency. So without permit fees coming in, our budget's been off 30%. So if you are in part of your company or you work in budgeting, 30% in a budget drop for in a basically a four-month period is huge. It's huge for us as an agency when our job description did not get any easier. In fact, it may have gotten more important long-term. We wanna make sure environmentally there aren't any problems and we watch an industry that will come back and we wanna make sure we're ready. So we've gone to the legislature this cycle and said, look, we're off 30% again. And they said, you're off 30% again. We went, yes, 14, 15, we were off about 25%, but here we are in, in 1920 and we're off we were great in 19. We thought we'd make it through. And here we are in 20. We're off 30%. And oh, no, it's a, a good way it's a railroad to, commission updates to resolve um, when this at this point. She, the head of the Railroad Commission is giving a conference. So, um, so we've gone into the legislative session saying, look, we don't want to gain anything. We just want to hold our own. And we want to make sure that if we have some dollars that we need available, we please make sure you give us some dollars we are the most important agency, and they recognize that. Um, it's helpful if you see anybody or talk to any legislator in the next week, remind them of that. It's always important. But I do. Uh, we've had a bunch of conversations, and how we, we fund ourselves long-term is a continuing question. We're probably the only agency I always say that we go way up when industry goes way up, and then we go way down with y'all, and then we kind of recover, but not to the full extent. And so that's a challenge for us as we are sitting in this budget cycle. That being said, we are doing our job. We think we're doing our job. We have not laid off anybody. That's our real goal. But where we've cut back has to do with remediation, site remediation, trucks, hardware, things that everybody else is trying to cut back on as well. Uh, so that budget conversation is important to us. Uh, we'll see what they do. Part of that, and some of you who ever look at our website, have, has to do with our technology upgrade. When I got to this agency, uh, most of y'all are not going to understand what I'm getting ready to say because it's such old stuff. So I don't understand what I say most of the time when we talk about technology. We were logging in with Novell. We are on a Fortran mainframe based system with a tetrabyte of data. See, I've been watching a few faces. You're going, I don't understand what that means. Old stuff. We still have a, a whole library that is half the size of a big conf or size of a big conference room in some of your some of your buildings times five. Uh, that's in hard copy with microfilm. Mm -hmm. We teach people how to use that microfilm. So IT upgrades have been important since I've been at this agency. We've done quite a bit. We were in hard copy for everything when I got to this agency and it was taking 60 days plus to get a drilling permit out the door. Today, we have upgraded that part of our system. It takes us two days to get a drilling permit out and that's before the downturn. So we've done a good job upgrading our system. We went into the legislature last cycle and said, look, we have a plan. We have a 
60 million, $70 million plan over a seven year program to get off a of mainframe and get off of Fortran and really morph our system into a much more user-friendly system. Uh, they gave us $25 million last cycle. So we're in the process of that. And we signed our contract last February. Life, So we can't give the money back at this point. That was my comment. And we also can't stop. And so they've recognized that they're again giving the dollars for the to continue our process. And so for those of you who do use our system or think you use, would like to use our system, our mapping, GIS mapping system, I think has gotten even more improved in the last several years. And you'll see us roll out the next phases of our programs by late summer, early fall. We're excited about this. Um, it is going to really make us even more efficient as an agency, but frankly, more transparent with our data. That's been important for us. Everybody wants our data. If you use a, an off, an off another program, you're probably using our data. It's about 24 hours behind. If you're, if you're paying for it, we'd like you to be able to use our data in real time. And that's a real priority for us. So, um, so you'll continue to see that upgrade. A couple other things that we're working on that everybody's still talking about, obviously, is weather and the winter storm. I was without power for four days, so no, I didn't get an early heads up either. For those of you who are wondering, I sat in the dark and sat in the cold too. This has been a real challenge for this state, quite frankly. And so at the Railroad Commission, our priority is and will continue to be our gas utilities that come into your home. If you go look at how those gas utilities performed, 99.95% of them of those get customers that get gas into their homes, of which there are 4.6 million, 99.95% of those of those customers had gas the whole time. We only lost 2,100 customers across the state. Uh, that is a priority for this agency to make sure that gas is supplied to your home. That being said, what we recognized with our, with our uh, partners that are in the gas world and are in the electric world during this time is that the ERCOT world and the PUC world didn't realize how important gas was to the state. So, so we sat in the cold day two on Tuesday morning and we're having regular com daily conversations with not just those three agencies, but gas companies across the state oil and gas companies out in the field, gas utility companies, electric utility companies, and poles and wires trying to make sure we could flow gas, get stuff out of storage. We, we pulled for a maximum amount of storage in the state for about five straight days. Um, what, how we could get the electric grid back up. There was a recognition on that Tuesday, on Tuesday morning, the whatever, the 15th, 16th of that day, that, uh, the PUC and ERCOT didn't realize how interconnected we were and how important we all were as a gas in the oil and gas world. And we kind of looked at them and we went, what? They said, yes, we just didn't understand how interconnected we were. And about that point in the conversation, we went, okay, fine. And the oil and gas world started calling me specifically, but other people and saying, if you'll turn the power back on, into the oil fields and the gas fields, we'd be glad to flow gas back into the system. And so on that Tuesday afternoon, a lot of phone calls again occurred and we started calling in coordinates to gas to uh, power lines and saying, look, here's where you need to turn the, the power back on. We can't flow gas without power. And that became the conversation that people didn't understand. Um, you've seen a lot of information back and forth and a lot of, uh, a lot of, op-eds and a lot of blame. The point to, in my mind is, I don't care who to blame is, I don't want it to happen again. And so what we started having conversations about what are real solutions so this doesn't happen again. And we went to the legislature with that and said, look, and well, I got to testify five straight days. I'd like to not do that part again either in front of the Texas legislature. And we testified again and also in Congress too. This is a serious conversation, but part of what we suggested as an agency that it looks like the legislature is going to pass is let's map and see what we have. We know from GIS mapping and mapping, we know where every well is. We know where every pipeline is in this state. Let's figure out what's critical, what flows where. Let's then put the power lines on top of us. And so we know what we should or shouldn't have on, what we should or shouldn't turn off. 
and what critical infrastructure is. That's going to be important long term. And legislatures put that in a bill that is beginning to that are that is moving. And um, we also suggested I. I alluded to, we were having conversations da daily with this Texas Energy Reliability Council. We've suggested that they put that council in statute, put the Railroad Commission, the PUC, uh, and other agencies and have a, str a hard structure so we know who should be talking to who. Again, that legislation looks like it's moving. So those a couple of other uh, suggestions that we've made or someplace in the process. And for us as an agency, you will see us after session, uh, relook at the curtailment order, meaning the priority of gas goes to uh, priority customers. And we relooked at that in an emergency order during this time period too. As an agency, we are gonna relook at that again. We think we should, it's been since 1973 that we've looked at that. So it's well past time, about half the customers in the state now get their power, now get their gas and their, their heat from electricity. That's changed a lot. So we've, we're beginning to see what the legislature, and I say beginning because they kind of paused for a few weeks. We'll be, we're beginning to see what they'll do for the end of session. And then we will have rulemaking and, and go through a process to make sure that pro whatever they decide we should do doesn't happen again. We think that's going to be a priority coming out of session. We hope they pass something that makes good common sense so we can all work through that process. Uh, the last piece I want to touch on, and I want to leave some time for questions, has to do with kind of the difference in federal governments that we're now seeing. Look, we had a federal government change in January, and that changes what we're looking at as an agency and the and the policies are beginning to change from the federal government from where we were for the last four years. So I I look at what they're doing and I go back and look at the Obama administration, which is just five years ago. Uh, and like I said, I've been sitting for a while, so we kind of get to see the difference in federal administrations. If you go back just five years ago, the, the Obama administration, as they walked out the door as an agency, we were watching 144 rules and regulations that would have affected what we regulate as an agency. That's a lot of rules and regulations to try to keep up with. A lot of those rules and regulations we already do in this state, uh, but there were that was some of the proposals that we were watching, whether it was oil and gas, coal, water, clean air, all of those rules and regulations. The Trump administration walked in the door and it, by the end of their administration, most of those 144 had been wiped out except for four. So we were watching four rules and regulations as they walked out the door. Now we're watching this new administration, which philosophically have, they've been public about the fact that they think we need, that we're back in the Paris Accord. They think we need to be limiting what we drill. And we've watched them for the short term limit new permits on federal lands, which thankfully we're in Texas. We don't have a lot of federal lands, we're only 5%. So that won't affect us directly. But what it will do is affect our partners and our state partners in Oklahoma, for instance, in New Mexico, that are both 50% federal lands. So those states are concerned and as are other Western states. So we're watching what this new administration does and what their policies are. It could affect how this oil and gas world is, is continues to develop. Today, you know, day one, they, they shut down the Keystone XL pipeline. I got to talk to one of my counterparts in Canada the next day and they said, what are y'all doing? I said, I'm not doing it. My part's open and has been. Um, but I think our partners, both in Canada and Mexico, are watching what the United States does and the policies from the federal government and how they're working with states. And so we hope that they call and have conversations with us. We haven't seen that yet. Uh, and we're concerned about what they could or couldn't do long-term to a vibrant industry that not just for this state and this country, but around the world is sip, shipping LNG products and refined and unrefined crude all over the world every day. So at the end of last month, you'll, I've got numbers that say that we shipped 4.1 million barrels of, of crude across the, the world and 5.1 million barrels of refined products across the world as a, a week, um, as of, or I should say a day as of um, the end of, of April. 
those are real dollars. They're real opportunities across the world. And a lot of LNG is being shipped across this from this country across the world to, to our friends like in Japan, South Korea, Poland. And so those opportunities are important for the state and important for this country. It's a job creator long-term for not just this country, but across the world. So we hope that they take that into consideration and, and have common sense thoughts as they go forward about what, how we move whatever that is to the next to the next uh, century. But we think that what is going on in, in California as far as their electric grid and then moving off of natural gas and frankly nuclear just to alternative energy is not a good plan. We're a high growth state and we think all of, of the above are important. So with that, um, I kind of touched on a lot of things. If anybody's got any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them, but I appreciate seeing a lot of women in a room. It's not always normal in an energy industry. I think we're beginning to get there a lot more than we were even five years ago. And it's exciting to see all of you engage. So thank y'all. Chairman Craddock, thank you so much. That was fantastic. I learned a lot and there are questions coming in, but I had one I wanted to start off with. I wanted to see if you would tell us a little bit more about your backstory and how you made it to the Railroad Commission. Well, thanks for asking. I forget to put that in sometimes. So, and I'd like, anybody wants to run for office call because we're looking by the way. So I grew up in Midland, Texas. The, I call it the heart of the oil industry. If you're in Houston or Midland, you one or the other is pretty important to the state. And my dad's been in the oil and gas industry. He's a mud salesman for my whole life. So, you know, you sit at the table, you learn about the oil and gas industry and and you understand how important it is. And I went through the downturn of the 80s too, that ages me a little bit, but I remember how that was in, how it is important for this industry to be vibrant in the state and what the jobs and job creation are. And so when I, I went out after law school, I got involved, not just in the oil and gas industry, but tax environmental issues. And about 11, in 2011, this, this agency was going through what's called sunset. Uh, every state agency goes through legislative process to see if they really should be uh, an agency anymore. And this agency was having some challenges. It was the beginning, kind of the middle of the Barnett Shale, the beginning of horizontal drilling really in the state. And I, this agency had uh, was not communicating well, I don't think, to not just to industry, it wasn't prepared, wasn't ready to go for the growth we've seen, but wasn't communicating to the general public. And I thought there was an opportunity to run for office. So running from Travis County as a Republican, never having run for public office before, I decided I was going to run for the Railroad Commission. My mother thought I was nuts. And my dad was, was surprised too. And look, I worked the hardest and there were six people in my race. All of us were friends and I, I won. And so it's been a great place to be. Uh, you don't have to have run, for, you don't need to have run for office before, but I think being engaged, understanding what was important and having some priorities for this agency has been, and which we're beginning to finally get there and accomplish and trying to make sure this agency is the most is the most relevant agency again in the state's been important to me. So um, that's kind of how I got there. It wasn't wasn't really in a plan. In fact, I wasn't going to run for office. I thought that people who did that were kind of crazy. I still do think that, by the way. But I think that we need. But women change the conversation. I think it's important for women to be engaged. And if you're passionate about something, um, then I think it gets you down the road. So uh, it's been a, it's been a great place to be, and I'm excited to to still be here. Um, so I'm getting some questions, you know, allocation wells are important. And so thanks for bringing this up about a week, week and a half ago. Now we got a judgment against the railroad commission on a ruling we had made that has to do with allocation wells. Allocation wells are, are going to continue to be important. We will as an agency appeal that ruling. We got one of the worst judges we could have gotten probably in Travis County one of the things people don't recognize, we, we make lots of rulings when we are in our agency meetings. Uh, people don't recognize all of that gets can be appealed through Travis County, and then it goes through the third court of appeals and then up to the Supreme Court if, if it does if it goes all the way up. So we were ruled against in a specific case on allocation wells. We got probably the most liberal judge who is 
doesn't ever understand any issue um, that is not in, that is about us, period, we recognize, but we will appeal that. That being said, we will continue to issue allocation well permits. Um, we think it's today that's what we've been advised by the attorney general and what to do. So that conversation will continue to occur. Look, we've issued thousands, and I don't know the exact number, but I always say 10,000. I think it's probably more than that of the number of allocation wells we've issued in the, since 2010, even before I was there. So I don't think that we'll, we'll end that practice at this point. That's not what we've been advised to do by our attorneys. So um, don't panic yet, but it's going to be a conversation and an important conversation, by the way. Let's see, what other questions did we have? Um, Oh, here it is. You know, I, so we're talking, you know, we're getting a lot of conversations. I think that a lot of the conversations are about ESG. I think that's all this industry seems to be talking about right now. Uh, that's important. It's not, not always the most important thing, but I know it's important as people are going and looking at um, financing specifically. Methane and, and flaring has been important to this industry and important to this agency. The last couple of years specifically, we've been looking at flaring. And if you'll look at what we did just about nine months ago, we put a new, well, maybe six months ago, but had started the conversation nine months ago, we put a new flaring data sheet in place. It went live May 1st, and you will see it electronically live by the end of the summer. It's part of our IT upgrade that we're looking at. Uh, we think it's important to have more data and more information and be more transparent in the information we're getting. That being said, our agency for the last two years have been, has been looking at flaring and what we do or don't do going forward. If you'll look at the flaring Except exceptions we give in our public inf in our public conferences, we're now limiting those exceptions not just by volume but by year. It's been a serious conversation that we've looked at. We've had industry come to us in the past year and say we appreciate we are part of the the issue and we want to come figure out what could be part of the solution. So we are continuing to work with them as well to figure out common sense solutions. I will say this, I, we're not going to be Colorado. We've wa watched and looked at uh, what New Mexico's done. We're looking to see what North Dakota, how they continue to morph their, uh, their flaring permit and their flaring rules as well. So it's an ongoing conversation. That being said, We've watched in the past year that industry's really trying to do their part without us re changing rules. Consistent rules and regulations are important to all of us. Uh, we're now flaring about 0.7% of the, of the gas that we're producing in the state. It's gone down about a percentage for the last three years. So we are doing a better job in the state. Doesn't mean we're perfect. And we are hoping that as more production continues to come back, that people are smart about developing a plan and a strategy to get their gas to market without a lot of flaring. Let's see, I think there are other questions potentially. So there's one um, says, California and other states have banned natural gas hookups in new construction. What are your thoughts on this? Actually yesterday, I think, or this week, the governor just signed a bill that uh, does not allow any city to ban natural gas hookups. And I think that was a good plan for the state. Look, we just came through a cold, the worst cold snap we've had maybe in my lifetime. I hope I don't see it again. But that being said, if you had natural gas in your house, you had heat and that's important. Not only that, it's it's cost effective in this, in this country and in the state to have natural gas. So the legislature has been watching that and they the governor signed a bill banning any community or any state from um, not allowing natural gas hookups. We are not gonna be California for a lot of reasons. There are a lot of reasons California is moving to Texas. And so, and I think, look, we can, we can fight back and forth about who has better electricity and better grids at this point, but long-term we have better common sense, I think, and better regulations. So, um, so I think that that was an important piece that has just happened today or yesterday, I guess. Excellent. 
Uh, another question from Gretchen. It was interesting to see the Texas Railroad Commission participate in the Army Corps reinsurance of the nationwide permits. And you know, I don't know a lot about that, but we do comment on a staff level about a lot of issues. And so um, we appreciate that that they're look we that our staff is involved in a lot of different issues. And and so um, so I don't know specifically about that one. I'm sorry, I just don't. And one from Tracy that I think you may have touched on. Um, but how should the Railroad Commission support the shift to greener, more diverse energy in Texas? Look, I think that we're seeing energy of all part of all kinds be important in the state. And so part of what we are trying to make sure as an agency we have in place is best practices of all of our rules. But I think reality is natural gas and coal and oil are not going away in a lifetime. And so making sure that that those people who are drilling, producing, and shipping that have best practices and that we are working through those rules from other states too, is going to be important for the state to continue to be vibrant going forward. And another one, can you elaborate on the top two or three items on your watch list of federal legislation that would impact the Railroad Commission? Well, the first one we're watching today and we'll have been watching really for a year has to do with the infrastructure bill, right? I've, I think everybody's heard about the infrastructure bill. Um, it's an interesting bill. I would say about a third of it's really infrastructure and the rest of it, frankly, is the Green New Deal and a tax bill. And so we're concerned about that. We're watching to see how that progresses. The one piece that could be helpful for us as an agency, and we will, we are happy to continue to take advantage of federal dollars if they are there, has to do with abandoned wells and well plugging. So we in this state since the, since 1999, 2000, have had a well plugging program for abandoned wells, meaning wells that we can't find the operators and, and those wells then come to the Railroad Commission, we do an inspection on those wells, we prioritize them based on environmental risks, and then we plug those, we plug wells. Um, we send them out for contract, but we're in charge of plugging abandoned wells. And so in this state, we do that regularly. We've had a vibrant program, like I said, since 1999, 2000. This, this year and the past four years, we've plugged roughly 1,400 wells a year. Uh, we are at roughly 6,200 wells that are sitting on our books. That includes bay wells that General Land Office would have permitted out in the water. There are 75 of, of those sitting out in the water. Uh, and those cost roughly a million dollars a well to plug. So the, this is an important program for us in the legislature. We've asked them to give us dollars to plug roughly a thousand for the next two years. And it's an ongoing process. Um, so that, that continues to be important. We see in that federal infrastructure bill that there could be an opportunity for us to apply for dollars to continue that well plugging program with federal dollars. We're, we're happy to do that. We think that's a real opportunity. We're looking to see what that legislation entail, entails as it moves forward. So I would say the infrastructure bill is really important. There's a lot of opportunity in that bill, but not a lot of infrastructure. And I think that's a concern first and foremost. And I would say that's the biggest bill we're watching. Um, you've got FEMSA, the Federal Pipeline Emergency Management agency um, is up for sunset. They just keep continuing them. And so we'll see in reauthorization, we'll see how that works if they actually do that this year. I say that because it could affect how we do inspections and what those inspections look like. And we want to make sure we're on, we're at the forefront of those inspections instead of behind. Well, again, we're a big state. So those would be the two big pieces of legislation we're looking at. Uh, but it's not just legislation. It really is as much about policy in, in these federal agencies. So whatever EPA does with methane again and all of the rules and regulations that we anticipate may come back or that they will potentially look at, uh, Bureau of Land Management, Department of Interior uh, with, with uh, endangered species and other issues that they deal with, those, 
a lot of the rulemakings that we anticipate will come or that we are looking at to see what the policy shifts are, are as important as legislation at this point. Uh, another question, any plans to have a Railroad Commission conference again, attended several years ago, this is from Sarah, and it was fantastic and great to hear the technical sessions and meet the folks we work with. You know, thanks for that question, because we really liked it too, by the way, and we had it planned for another one planned for last summer, and, and we are not planning one yet for this summer because of COVID. It's been a weird year. I would anticipate and hope we do one next year. That being said, we've been doing, I know, quite a few webinars and trying to do some one-on-one -on -one outreach in that respect. So we're, we are... We have not written that off, but it's been a weird couple of years. So I would hope by next year, we're all ready to do that again. Uh, we thought we got a lot of feedback from it and we think that's important. If you've got some issues though, that you can't get somebody to answer the phone or you'd like some it, it questions answered, you're welcome to call my office. Very good. Uh, are there any other questions for the chairman? Those are the ones I see in chat, but Somebody else has a question, feel free to, to ask. All right, well, I hope y'all all join me in thanking uh, Chairman Craddock. That was fantastic. Uh, appreciate your time. We recognize that you are incredibly busy <laughs> and I'm very impressed with all the information that you can retain and, and, well, and talk you. about all the numbers. But um, very informative, and that was that was that's great. Thank you for being our guest today. Thank you, thank you, Laura. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. If anybody has any further questions or follow up, you're welcome to call my office or email us. But I appreciate it, and thank you all for what you do and being engaged. Have a great thank day. You. Thanks. And now uh, we will go to our second breakout. Um, I think we probably have about ten minutes for that. And so, you know, discuss your key takeaways from today and Chairman Craddock's uh, talk, and then we'll see you back here to close things out in probably about 10 minutes. You all to please update your online WIN profile with any new information so that you can continue to receive important news and reminders. Being connected is so important in this digital environment, and I really recommend connecting with us on LinkedIn to get the latest updates. Well, that brings us to a close for today's luncheon. I'd like to give one last thank you to Chairman Craddock and to all of you who tuned in. Stay safe, stay dry. We hope to see you again in person soon.